from the headquarters of Telesa English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the South, and I am Sani Gray. The former Vice President of Ecuador, Jorge Glass, has been hospitalized. Doctors say his condition is stable. And he has been transferred to a hospital in the capital of Quito. Now, Glass was rushed to the hospital on Tuesday night. He apparently began to suffer blackouts, and his wife said his health had deteriorated sharply. He had been on a hunger strike for 17 days to protest being moved to a high-security prison in Latachunga. Glass was imprisoned last year for alleged involvement in the Odebrecht corruption scandal. Our correspondent in Quito, Denise Herrera, has the latest. Hello, yes, indeed, the Ecuadorian former Vice President Jorge Glass was hospitalized after 17 days of hunger strike. This news was updated on the Twitter account of his lawyer, Franco Lord, who confirmed the condition of Jorge Glass was deteriorated and now his life is in danger. Also, uh, now uh, Jorge Glass is in, in a hospital in Quito where his medical team said uh, his health is stable for now and also in a press conference his friends and close friends of the citizen revolution movement confirmed the really bad conditions uh, inside the jail that Jorge Glass has to throw out. He said that uh, Jorge Glass didn't have a bathroom close to him inside the jail and also that the authorities inside the jail and the authorities of Ecuador are violating his fundamental rights and freedoms now. He is also demanding to the authorities and to the international media outlet to take care of Jorge Glass and also to, to tell about to his situation about his condition now inside the jail. For now, Jorge Glass will be at the hospital in Quito and they are calling to the authorities of Ecuador. His close friend, legal team and family said that they're responsible of his condition and now of his life is the current government. So it's all for now. Back to you at the studio. Thank you, Denise, for that report. In an exclusive interview with Telesur, the former Ecuadorian president, Rafael Correa, spoke about what he called the plot to steal the vice presidency from Jorge Glass. If I were living in Ecuador, I would be in prison, just like Jorge Glass. I still have great solidarity for Jorge, who was trusted in the Ecuadorian legal system. We all believe in it without knowing the scope of the plot that was being planned behind the scenes. He is in prison due to the Odebrecht scandal. Let the world know not one of those who confessed to being involved in that case were ever brought to trial. Those who paid people off, they are not even under investigation because they made a deal to steal the vice presidency from Glass and they walk away free. Jorge trusted in Ecuadorian justice and now has been in prison for nearly a year, but he's a brave man of integrity. And now he's on hunger strike because authorities decided to move him to a maximum security prison as a response to an unrelated case of another former member of my government who fled the country. Representatives of the migrant caravan in Mexico City are hoping to meet with the president-elect, Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrado, on Thursday. And while the migrants say they are scheduled to do so, the government is yet to confirm the meeting. Now, hundreds participated in a session where they discussed exactly when they will leave the Mexican capital and the routes they will take to reach the United States. Now, some migrants say they wish to stay longer in Mexico City, while others wanted to continue the journey to the U.S. as soon as possible. According to Donald Trump, we are criminals. Thank God we are not criminals. And I ask him now, with all my heart, to open the doors for us. The only thing we're looking for is a better job. I'm telling Trump that we are not all criminals. Some of us are fighters for a better life, but we don't come to provoke war or harm. Let's go now to our correspondent, Pablo Perez, who's at the Jesus Montanez Stadium in Mexico City, where around 5,000 migrants have taken temporary shelter before they decide their next step. Yes, we're right here at the Jesus Martinez Palillo Stadium in Mexico City, a place where uh, hosts usually uh, 
sporting events, but right now is the home to over 4,000, 4,500 migrants. They have set up, set up camp here after a strenuous walk of 760 miles uh, from the Guatemalan border. And they're taking a rest and deciding what's their next step to take. They're uh, organizing several assembly and on a, a, sta a state or departamento or city level from uh, where, the, where their hometowns are in Honduras uh, so they can decide where to go next and when to leave, which is the most important. There are like two main views. We have on one hand, the younger, the stronger, they want to leave right now to the northern border to the border with the United States and on the other hand we have families a lot of them ha uh, have small children or elder people that ha uh, ha uh, have more vulnerable health and they want to rest they want to regain their strength uh, uh, before they leave to the next step on their journey and what the, another interesting thing is there a lot of people considering to ask for refugees, uh, uh, refugee status or asylum here in Mexico uh, as they know that uh, the Donald Trump's government are going to make it really hard for them to obtain it in the States. So they say, we don't care where we are, we don't need to be in the States, we only want a place peaceful where we can work and have a dignified life. This is the situation here in Jesus Martinez Stadium in Mexico City. We go back to you. We thank Pablo Perez for that report. Now, the first migrant caravan had a rest stop in Mexico City after a 20-day journey from Central America in search of a better life. Volunteers are helping them before they continue on to the U.S. border. Several volunteers were on hand at a shelter in Mexico City, built specifically to house asylum seekers and migrants from the caravan. The first group to receive help are the children, since according to UNICEF, around 2,300 minors are part of the migrant group. We first bond with them. We talk and try to get closer to the children so they can trust us. They have told us that they have been walking for days now, that they haven't eaten properly, and that they don't have shoes. They just want to play. Volunteers are also on hand to provide psychological help. It's no doubt the journey of more than 20 days has affected the migrants. We have helped people under a lot of stress and anxiety. They are grieving their loss, the fact they left their country behind as well as their family members, and in some cases, their children. Those who were forced to leave their countries are all too familiar with the risks of traveling through Mexico, a territory plagued by violence. I was told about the danger that women face, that some are kidnapped, and about organ trafficking, but I have to be strong. For those who joined the migrant caravan, the majority from Honduras are not forgetting the reasons why they left their home country. Cesar, for example, says he was repressed by the state. It happened when our president, Juan Orlando Hernández, was re-elected. He repressed the people with the help of security forces. That is why we are running away. The caravan is set to leave Mexico City after everyone rests from 20 days of their treacherous journey before pushing onto the United States. Some are trying to regularize their immigration status. We'll take a short break now. More news in a minute. Welcome back. Brazil's president-elect Jair Bolsonaro has met his predecessor, Michel Temer, at a ceremony to mark the 30th anniversary of the country's constitution on Tuesday. At the Brazilian National Congress, Bolsonaro said his government will continue on President Temer's path and that he respects the constitution. The two-day two trip to Brasilia is an initial step towards the government's transition. Bolsonaro is expected to meet Temer in this regard on Wednesday afternoon. And Brazil's future Justice Minister, Sergio Moro, has said that he has differences with President-elect Jair Bolsonaro. He also spoke about the President-elect's controversial gun law. 
There is a proposal about the use of weapons by civilians, but that will be discussed. I told them I am worried that excessive permission could be used by criminal organizations to generate more violence. So he has to think how many guns an individual can have at home. If there are too many, there is a risk of them being used for other things. Environmental and social organizations are condemning a presidential decree that will allow, allow oil exploration within the Ecuadorian Amazon. They argue that it puts the life of people living in isolated areas at risk. The Yas Unidos organization on its Twitter account posted a draft of the presidential decree that allows oil exploitation in the Amazonas area of Yasuní, home to the indigenous people of Huaurani. They argue the move violates human rights. The draft bill is being processed after President Lenny Moreno held a consultation. The lives of indigenous people is at risk in the Yasuní. The intention of the government is that this draft becomes a decree. Yasunidos is against the draft because it violates human rights by allowing the exploration of resources in part of the intangible zone. Several groups confirm this, so they are urging the Minister of Environment, Humberto Cholango, not to sign the decree. They state that the goal of the consultation was to protect the area, but they'll be endangering it if the draft is approved. This draft is anti-constitutional, and it goes against the government's own consultation. According to the director of research at the Catholic University of Ecuador, who has spent years studying Yasuní, the area should not be touched because it's a place of sanctuary for the people who live there. I think the need for economic resources can have positive results, but in the long term it will be regrettable. It will be extremely negative. The problem is that the government is one thing and the society is another one, and we can't agree. Yasunidos expressed their concerns about the indigenous people at the Ministry of Justice, which no longer exists, so now they are loving the Ministry of Environment. They argue that the ministry permits oil exploitation of the Yasuní, in spite of reports informing them about the dangers. Trade unions in Chile are calling for a national strike on Thursday. Workers are demanding a new pension system and education and housing reform. Student movements and human rights activists are also set to join the strike. All of us who are here right now are aware that it is necessary to take to the streets in order to condemn these government policies. They promised more jobs and higher salaries. But what we see right now are less jobs. The severance rate is increasing. The salaries have not increased and the social security policies that should have saved us from this recession do not exist. Over a dozen people have been arrested in Peru for allegedly trafficking babies, including the former police chief. According to the Public Prosecutor's Office, Raul Becerra and 13 others, including a pediatrician and a gynecologist, are accused of running a gang that persuaded poor pregnant women into giving up their babies. Becerra was the police chief between 2010 and 2011. The authorities reportedly believe that Becerra's partner, Cynthia Tello, was the actual leader of the group. On Thursday, Grenada and Antigua and Barbuda voted against adopting the Caribbean Court of Justice as their final appeal court, replacing the UK-based Privy Council. The referendum fell short of the 67% of the votes required. The majority of the persons who turned out to vote opted for no. Experts have argued that the Privy Council is the last vestige of colonialism in the region and as such should be removed. Oh, okay. And the president of the Caribbean Court of Justice, Adrian Saunders, also acknowledged the CCJ referendum results via Twitter. He said, while this is not what we hoped for, we respect the mandate of the people and the courts will continue with its judicial initiatives within these countries as well as throughout the wider region. Cuban President Miguel Diaz-Canel has visited the Forbidden City in Beijing during his first official visit to China. Before his visit, Diaz de Canal met with the leader of the State Council of the People's Committee, Wang Yang. The Cuban president will sign agreements on trade, renewable energy, and the Belt and Road Initiative. Next, Diaz de Canal will visit Vietnam and Laos. 
El Salvador's Ministry of Education is putting on a school farms festival. By doing so, it hopes to instill and develop an entrepreneurial sp spirit in students of all ages. <laughs> The Orchards and School Farms Initiative aims to develop skills in agricultural production. School children can now enjoy a healthy food menu in their schools. You can see children enjoying various natural juices made from spinach, lime or even cucumber. This is something they didn't have before. The festival took place in San Salvador's Libertad Park. Students from four different departments took part. Across the country, there are nearly 2,000 orchards and 21 school farms that benefit over 160,000 students. We are eating healthier produce. When we make our own food, we know it's clean and it has no pesticides unlike buying stuff from the supermarket. Using agroecological techniques, young people are taught how to protect the environment and how to stay healthy. Environmental organizations provide guidance for students by teaching them how to plant native seeds and reduce the use of toxic chemicals for clean production. This shows us that this can be done. We need to teach young generations to grow their own crops and do it in a sustainable manner. We need to teach them to protect the environment. Investment in these orchids near 1.6 million US dollars and has spread good agricultural practices across communities. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back. Leaders of the Democratic Republic of Congo's main opposition parties will meet in Switzerland on Thursday in another attempt to choose a joint candidate for the upcoming presidential elections. Felix Shikedi, son of the late veteran opposition leader, has emerged as a leading candidate following the legal exclusion of frontrunner jean pierre Bemba and Moise Katumbi. A Namibian Liberation War veteran has said that the United States meddling in other countries' affairs has resulted in a lot of misery and suffering for a lot of people. David Schwimwino is a former commander of the South West African People's Organization. Nowadays, nobody at the international level, nobody is supporting the war anymore. Look at the destruction that has been caused in Libya, for example, in Iraq. So it will cause, and today it's happening in Lebanon. 90 students who were kidnapped in Cameroon in two separate incidents have been released. Although the authorities have not given details of the circumstances under which they were released, they said that 11 students who were abducted on October 31st and then 79 others were kidnapped on Sunday. And they all belong to a secondary school in Bamenda in the northwest of the country. <coughs> The Attorney General of the U.S., Jeff Sessions, has been fired by President Donald Trump after Sessions stepped down as a judge in, the, in an investigation into Russia's role into the 2016 presidential race. Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer has urged the acting Attorney General, Matthew Whitaker, not to interfere with the investigation. I find the timing very suspect, number one, but number two, Num the, our paramount view is that any attorney general, whether this one or another one, should not be able to interfere with the Mueller investigation in any way. They should not be able to end it. They should not be able to limit it. They should not be able to interfere with uh, Mueller going forward and doing what he thinks is the right thing. And that will help guide us as we go through this process. And during a press conference earlier today, a very unusual interaction took place between the President of the United States 
and CNN reporter Jim Acosta. When Acosta questioned Trump over the ongoing investigation into alleged collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russian government during the 2016 general elections, they had a heated exchange. Honestly, I think you should let me run the country. You run CNN, All right. and if you did it well, your ratings well, let me would be ask, much better. If I, if I may okay, ask one enough. other question, Mr. President, if I may, if I may ask Peter, one other question, are you worried? That's enough. That's no, enough. Mr. President, I, well, that's I was enough. going to ask one of the other folks. That's had, enough. Pardon me, ma'am. I'm, I'm, Mr. Excuse President, me. that's enough. Mr. President, I had one other Peter, question, if I may ask, on, on the Russia investigation. Are you concerned that... That you may have I'm not concerned about anything with the Russian investigation because it's a hoax. Are you, That's enough. Put down the mic. Mr. President, are you worried about indictments coming down in this investigation? Mr. President. Mr. President. I'll tell you what, CNN should be ashamed of itself having you working for them. You are a rude, terrible person. You shouldn't be working for CNN. Go ahead. Uh, here's... The U.S. President Donald Trump has called a reporter racist. Here's more on that and some other stories from around the world. U.S. President Donald Trump is known for holding back his controversial views, especially when it comes to immigration. But on this occasion, he took offense to a supposedly racist question from a PBS NewsHour reporter during a press conference in Washington, D.C. Yamiche al Sindor asked, if his identification as a nationalist had emboldened white nationalists. Here's what Trump had to say. That's such a racist question. Honestly, I mean, I know you have it written down and you're going to tell me. Let me tell you, that's a racist question. The Italian Senate has approved a bill on security and immigration. If the bill is approved, it will become increasingly difficult for migrants to be granted asylum. The Interior Minister Matteo Salvini said he was confident that the new law would be passed soon. I just say that a strict policy lowers their arrivals. A less rigorous policy raises their arrivals. But I don't lecture the Spanish government, whom I still thank today for welcoming the Aquarius ship. Human rights activists in Pakistan who support the acquittal of a Christian woman accused of blasphemy have appealed to Prime Minister Imran Khan to not be cowed down in standing behind the Supreme Court's decision. At a press club involving human rights activists, lawyers and civil society members urged Khan to build consensus and establish a writ of the state. Asiya Bibi had been on death row since 2010 for allegedly insulting Islam. She was acquitted by the court, sparking mass protest by Islamists. And that brings us to the end of this news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them all on our website at tellusyourenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Sweeney Gray. Thank you for watching.